Good afternoon and welcome to the second week of office hours webinars for ESG CV reporting. My name is Tommy Joe Bednar. I work with APT Associates and I'll just be covering a few items of housekeeping and logistics before we get into our presentation and our questions, uh, the meat of our webinar today. So first and foremost, um, we want to make sure that you all can hear everyone today and that you have the opportunity to be heard and ask questions. So as we are going through our webinar today, we encourage you to connect to audio via our call-in number. Um, computer audio can be a little bit choppy, um, though definitely it is better than not being able to hear us at all. But if you need to call in or would like to call in for some more reliable audio, um, please feel free to use the number there on the screen. We'll also include it in the chat in just a moment um, with that access code below. I want to also note for all of you that today's webinar is being recorded and it will be hosted along with the materials from today's webinar to the HUD exchange within two to three business days. Um, again, we'd like to encourage all of you to ask questions today, and you're welcome to use the chat feature, which I'll cover in a moment. Um, but we also want to give the opportunity for you to ask questions verbally and to let us know that you have a verbal question so that you can interact with our presenters today. Um, we'll have you use the hand raising feature. So that hand raising feature to raise your hand in WebEx is in the bottom right hand corner of your screen. It's going to look ever so slightly different from my picture here because of a new WebEx update. Um, but if you go ahead and look in the bottom right hand corner of your screen, there should be a little hand. And if you have a question, if you'd like to ask a question of one of our presenters today, go ahead and click on that hand. That'll raise your hand and indicate that you have a question. And then once you've asked the question and had the opportunity to be called on, just click on it again to lower it so that we know your question's been answered. So that we can hear your questions, please make sure to connect yourself to audio um, through the audio panels at the bottom of your screen. Again, the other feature to be able to ask questions today is the chat feature. Um, it's going to look a little bit different from that picture, but still going to be a chat bubble in the bottom right hand corner of your screen. Um, the purpose of today's webinar is office hours, so we hope that you'll ask plenty of questions either verbally or via chat. Um, so go ahead and click on that chat feature. And please make sure that you're sending all of your chat questions to everyone. That'll make sure that all of our panelists and all of our other attendees today can see your question and can benefit from that question being answered if it's answered verbally or in written form. With that out of the way, I want to go ahead and cover who our presenters will be today. Um, we have William Snow from HUD, the Office of Special Needs Assistance Programs, Michelle Budzik, the, uh, the Partnership Center. Meredith Alspa, the Partnership Center. And in the background, we also have uh, staff, including myself and Gene Goodman from APT Associates and PCL uh, for question and answer support. With that, I'm going to go ahead and hand things over to William Snow to start our webinar in progress today. Okay, thanks, Tommy Joe. Welcome everyone. We're excited to have another set of office hours. Again, this is the second one for this group. We'll have another one uh, next week. Uh, just to clarify the scope, this is not a general office hours. The scope of this office hours is focusing on ESCCB uh, reporting. So if you have questions about the notice that remain unanswered, uh, we likely will not answer them here either. Uh, those questions will need to go through the Friday office hours that happens from 2.30 to 4 Eastern time, or you can send an AAQ. So if I happen to know the answer or one of us on the phone knows the answer to your question and it is a more general question, we will attempt to answer it, but otherwise uh, there's a good chance we will not. Um, there are many questions uh, that are still outstanding uh, that we're speaking with the lawyers about. So probably if it's a question that hasn't been answered to date, it doesn't have an answer yet is the reality also. So just, just putting that out there, if you're asking a question that you've already asked before with no, uh, with no luck previously. So we're just going to cover a couple of small things before we jump into your questions. Uh, another reminder on roles. Roles just will always be kind of a big topic. Uh, for you, if you are ESG recipients, you should have logged into SAGE already. Uh, you're a week out from the start date. You should have some comfort going into SAGE, knowing at least what it looks like. So there's no uh, catching you off guard or catching you by surprise when you have to log in. Uh, you really should be submitting your or finalizing your bundles 
by October 1st or 2nd, really early in the month, so that the folks who are running the data have ample time to uh, verify the data quality, upload the data, and for you to be able to complete your submission process. So just a reminder for recipients, get started soon. Log in if you haven't. Um, the recipient is the one who's getting the money from HUD. They're the ones who have to kick off everything in SAGE. Uh, the subrecipients are collecting the data like normal. The HMIS provider is the one who, based on what's set up in SAGE, the bundles created in SAGE, uh, they're the ones who will then run the data. And remember, the recipient is setting up those bundles. The bundles represent um, the project by project type and common reporting start date in a specific HMIS implementation. So again, there's a couple variables that make up what goes into a bundle. Uh, for cities and counties, that's who we're focusing on today. Uh, thankfully, you don't have a lot of COCs that you're playing with. Uh, in terms of HMIS implementations, you're likely going to be interacting with a single implementation that makes it easy. Uh, if you have multiple HMISs you're going to have to uh, work with, and you, for each project type, you're going to have multiple, um, multi multiple bundles you, you set up. So just putting that out there, again, once the CSV files are run, then the recipient will need to go back into SAGE, complete anything outstanding like expenditure data or anything on unique DCB costs, and then don't forget to hit submit. Uh, one overarching exception to all this is uh, victim service providers. You are acting like normal, like a normal annual ESG. You will just be going in and creating um, or doing a CSV based on your data and submitting it, again, like you would as a sub under a normal ESG project. Uh, so with that, one other reminder that's not on the slide, we within HUD have been talking more about temporary emergency shelters uh, and what documentation looks like. We know you are interested in that. Uh, the one area we're talking about in particular is the public health authority interaction and what that looks like. So we don't have an answer on it. Um, we will give it to you as soon as we can, um, but I just wanted to let you know we're trying to figure out what do you do to document that they've been involved in the process or I've said that there's a need for temporary emergency shelter, how far do you have to go with that? Again, there's not an answer, there will be, uh, and you'll want to make sure you have it for documentation and, uh, and we'll let you know as soon as we have that information. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Michelle. Thank you, William. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. We um, just want to draw your attention to your dashboard and that um, a SAGE is ready um, for you to be able to enter your um, ESG CV program. There, um, Yesterday evening when we looked, there were only 15 of you that had started it already, which is a really scary number to us um, because the amount of kind of effort to do this is just, um, is just pretty steep. So we're hoping that you um, go in there very shortly, take a look at it, and actually start uh, start working on filling out your uh, projects. You can fill them out. But you, don't have to send the bundles, or you can send the bundles early. It doesn't matter. Um, the due date for that report is 10-30-2020. Um, there was a little bit of confusion about 10 days and 30 days at the very beginning of this that HUD went back and forth. It is 30 days. You do have 30 days from the um, start of the of any reporting period to um, to complete it and submit. Um, and we want to remind you, as always, that submitting it is important. It's due 1030. That means you have to click submit. You can't forget that step. Um, it's somehow really easy to do in ESG. Uh, we did um, have a call with the HMIS leads. And um, we heard them loud and clearly say 24 hours just wasn't going to be enough time for them to do the due diligence they thought they needed to do to see if all the projects were in their bundles uh, it, it, and that they didn't have anybody they shouldn't have, uh, you know, et cetera. Um, and so HUD made the decision to change that 24 hours to three days. So how that three days works is that from the day you send the email, 
they get then three full days. So if you send it on Monday, day one is then Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. On Thursday night at midnight, the system will lock and they won't be, the recipient will no longer be able to change the bundles. If um, in day one, day two, day three, there's a problem, the recipient is going to have to call back all the bundles and redo them, or perhaps just call back one or two and redo it. But this, the system will be open for, to allow them to do that. Um, on day four, then, the CSV is open, uh, uh, available for upload. Uh, and that's the same thing that would happen if you actually have your bundles ready now and wanted to send them out to your HMIS lead to take a look at them um, and get ready for this, that's fine. They will not be able to upload them until day four of, uh, of the month. So that, that's just how it will work every quarter, that um, at midnight at the end of the third day, um, the system will be unlocked and they'll be able to upload. Um, and with that, we're going to questions. Meredith. Sure, we've got a couple here. Um, am I muted? No, okay. Um, the first one is we have begun the setup for our executed contract. Will we be able to go back in quarter two to set up bundles for another category when those contracts are executed, or do we need to set up everything together? So each quarter, each, each time, you can add projects. What you want to be sure is that if you have projects that have started serving clients, you have those projects in the first initial reporting period and, um, and, and you're actually reporting on them. If you do not have projects serving clients, you can hold that, hold that off until the next reporting period and put them in then. Thank you. Uh, another question here, how are projects uh, such as hand washing stations identified for step three, identify ESG CV funded projects? So in the Sage launch pad there. So in the launch pad, there are no bundles for hand washing stations. Um, assuming you put the hand washing station outside and you didn't use renovation funding in a shelter to redo the hand washing stations in the shelter. But assuming you didn't, then it's a street outreach project. It, it only gets a narrative report. You don't have to do a CSC upload. We really don't need to know the name rank and serial number of everybody that washed their hands. Um, we get, you get a buy on that one. So far, those are the only two questions I've seen um, put in the chat. I don't know, Tommy Joe, if someone had sent any to the host directly. Um, I don't see anyone with their hand raised either, but if you have questions, please raise your hand or get them in the chat. So while we're waiting, and let me put in a timing piece that uh, Michelle had alluded to earlier that's good to know. Some of you are still waiting to get your grants executed. Uh, you don't have anything to do. If you have no executed grants, your quarterly report's easy, nothing. Let's say you have an executed grant and you have no expenditures. Uh, so you just haven't had time to do anything yet. Well, that's also easy. You're, you are gonna go in and say you have an executed grant. There will need to be a re reporting requirement, but you will not have to upload any data on clients. You haven't served any clients, uh, but you will need to go into the financial screens, unfortunately, and put zeros just so we know you have not made any expenditures. So that's also very easy. There is no reason to wait for October 1 for that even, right? If you are 100% sure, no expenditures, you could complete your reporting today, right? Like that's, that's just fine. Um, if you know that you're not gonna have any projects with clients up and going by October 1, but you may have some expenditures like training expenditures or even the hand washing stations where we don't require a CSV upload. Uh, just, just be aware that we are not gonna make you do a CSV upload, obviously, so that's gonna be pretty easy for you. You don't have this whole fun process of doing bundles if there's no CSVs involved. 
So you're going to essentially be reporting on financial data, and you'll be reporting on any narrative that's necessary. Uh, again, like hand washing, you'd have to say what, why that's related to COVID um, and what you did exactly. So just bear in mind that in this first reporting, all of you are all over the place for, for good reasons, right? Like just recognize that some of you may be able to do your reporting now and just get it out of the way. And there's nothing wrong with doing that. Uh, if you know you have CERC clients, but let's say you haven't uh, reimbursed a subrecipient yet, and you yourself haven't been reimbursed, our reporting is based on expenditures. So please make sure you're getting your data. If you know that you've served clients or a sub has served clients, you do need to get in expenditure information from that subrecipient. And there's, this is not an HMIS function. This is a recipient function. You have to figure out whatever process you're using. And again, it's, to us, it doesn't matter if you've reimbursed yet. It just matters if people have served, they will be reimbursed. You need the sub to tell you uh, what's the budget you know, line item and how much money is going to be associated with that. So uh, reporting on finances, it's all about expenditures. It's not about drawdowns or reimbursements at this point. So we use IDIS to track your drawdowns, and we certainly will use that and track your grants uh, within HUD and probably give you notices if we're not seeing you spend your money. Um, we'll give you some time on that. But So I just wanted to flag all those things because I know there is, I think, a rather large group that actually you don't really have anything to do this period, and you can you can get this over with really fast. And I think, sorry, there was a few questions that came in on that point. And maybe Michelle showing that step one in Sage of where they would select what they need to do, because you still have to submit something, um, even if it's saying you're submitting nothing. So I just want to make sure everyone's clear on that, too. Yeah, and that's for the case where they have an executed grant agreement. Right, if there's no executed grant agreement, you got no reporting to do. If you have an executed grant agreement, you're going to have to do something, even if it's small. So in Sage, um, if you go to your launch pad and um, When you would normally go into your launch pad, there wouldn't be anything selected. The first question it's going to ask you is, have you executed your grant agreement? If you say no, there's nothing you have to do but save this form. Sage will know you went in and saved it. That's all you have to do. If you um, have an executed grant agreement, then it's going to ask you, have you made any expenditures? If you say no to that question, SAGE is going to tell you to save, save this form, complete the financial information form with zero dollars that you spent, zero, sign and submit it. Real easy. It's only if you say yes to this question that sometimes you have to send in a CSV. So if you said yes only to HMIS and admin, um, you're, all you do is save the form and again submit the finan financial information and sign and submit it because there's no clients in HMIS or admin, so there's no um, upload required. If so, you've started serving clients and you've you provided hazard pay in the emergency shelter, then then you're going to do a full APR or a full, I'm sorry, full uh, ESGCV report, and you're going to um, have to submit the temporary emergency shelter that you provided hazard pay to. Thank you. I want to mm -hmm. go back um, to where you mentioned um, the hand washing, washing statements, uh, excuse me, hand washing stations under street outreach. Uh, we had a couple questions come in there that said, so street outreach activities are not required to submit a CSV report? Um, so maybe clarify what you mean with the unique activities under um, street outreach versus regular street outreach. Right. William, you want to do that? Or you want me to? Uh, I'll take a crack and you can let me know if there's more to add. So some of the activities under ESGCB, the unique activities, uh, are going to apply to street outreach. We've uh, designated that the hand washing stations will be. We are not adding any unique reporting requirements for that. 
So your normal street outreach project, and if you're uh, putting more money in, maybe hazard pay for staff in a street outreach project, you'll actually report on the clients like normal, but something like um, a hand washing station, we're actually adding in the financial form the place to report uniquely on these type of activities where there's, there's really nothing to report, right? Normal street outreach, you at least have contact engagement. A hand washing station, you really don't have anything, right? Nobody's standing there. We certainly don't have a strange expectation that you're going to know everyone who uses the hand, hand washing stations to clean their hands. So you just have to do a narrative, no special update. There are, there are not that many activities that fall under that, right? So training is one that we say reported under street outreach, um, and you don't have to do any special client-level data. The hand-washing stations is the other core one. And that, that's assuming that all you did was a hand washing station, that there was no worker out there trying to engage clients, bring them into housing, get them off the streets, give them PPE, do do anything else with the clients. That's that's saying that all you did was run out there and and put in a hand washing station, and and put up some uh, portalettes, right? Meredith? Okay. Um, got another one here. Can you please clarify if FEMA trailers are used, do they qualify as permanent housing? William? So that's definitely an HQ question, right? So that's beyond this group. Uh, my initial sense is no. Uh, I'm yet to see that approved as permanent housing, but I can't say that it could never be or would never be. There are a lot of circumstances where we just have to dig further. So I would send that to the AQ, but be prepared to provide a lot more context, like how on earth could that be considered permanent housing? Very rarely have we thought about it uh, or allowed that kind of circumstance. Even for emergency shelter, we've had very limited uh, options for that in the past. For under the temporary emergency shelter definition, we probably would allow it. So it wouldn't be a problem as temporary shelter, but as permanent, yeah, there's, there's a lot more that you, we'd have to look at there. Thank you. Um, I saw another one come through a little more nuanced, similar to a previous conversation we were just having. We are just executing contracts with subrecipients and we will be reimbursing for costs that occurred this summer. Can we provide estimates for the expenditures and then go back and edit them in future reports? I don't know the technical capacity on the SAGE side. So the intent is to report what you have, uh, and there is like we understand there's a lot of folks who are, will give us stuff later, uh, and we'll we'll have to update accordingly. We would ask that you get as much as possible. the The process for updating past data is going to be complicated uh, and cumbersome. So we're going to avoid that as much as possible, but uh, at the same time, yes, we want as much expenditure information that you have now, along with the clients you've served. I don't know, again, from a SAGE perspective, if there's a technical side that we need to at least make explicit for everyone. Um, there's nothing right now other than they would report it in their next quarter. So they would make the adjustment in their next quarterly report. Um, I'm honestly not sure that once the quarter is over, the adjustment can't be made in the next quarter because HUD really cares about what's going on to date more than they cared about what happened in each particular quarter, I believe. So we don't have a method now. If HUD would say to us, we need to go back and let you amend uh, a financial report we've come up with we'll come up with a methodology to do that okay can the recipient change the HMIS contact in SAGE so that a designated staff member who is not the primary HMIS contact for the COC can complete the uploads they're asking because the recipient stated she cannot change the HMIS lead contact um, but also stated they haven't expended funds yet. I've, I've certainly had a lot of questions about HMIS lead contacts. So there's one lead contact for each HMIS. Um, 
there are a lot of things that the HMIS can do if they want this, this email notice to go to multiple people. The contact doesn't have to be a person's name. It could be a distribution list. So in Outlook, you could set up a two or three person distribution list, and that would be the email that they would use. They would have um, the primary person's name and phone number to call, and then that email to send to. So you can use a distribution list. You, you can, there's lots of ways to manage that. Um, the recipient can change the, um, Contacts in um, Sage, they go and hit the edit button. And um, in this one, there aren't any, but they would just they would just edit it. There'll be an edit uh, button on the line for them to edit it with, and they can do that. And I'll pull up one that you can do in a minute while while Mary is asking another question, just to show you, but. Um, they can edit it. If they don't know how, have them send it in AAQ. Thanks. Uh, there's a couple mm -hmm. questions here about the timing for SAGE guidance. Um, and, you know, we, we said last time, and I said again today, that that guidance is under review with HUD. But, William, do you have an ETA or timeline on that before October 1st is the real question? <laughs> uh, that's a good question. So, uh, my intent that certainly is for it to get published before then, I need to verify who's got it right now. Uh, we certainly have a, an approval process that takes some time. So uh, I can't commit to October 1st, although I know that's fair for you to ask that. So uh, yeah, uh, we'll try to get it out by then uh, and I'll keep pushing on it. So sorry that it's not out yet because really uh, I know you want it now. And, and we did build in on every page instructions. So you should be able to, not that I don't want to have you read the guidebook, because I definitely do. <laughs> We've all spent way too much time on that for you to just ignore it. But there are also instructions on every page. So it's not like SAGE is not going to try to help you. The, um, the instructions are pretty specific about what you do on, on each individual page. Um, okay, William, there was a, a question, I'm not sure exactly what it was in reference to, that just said, are the spending benchmarks? So I don't know if you want to speak a little bit about the, the benchmarks for spending um, and its relation here with reporting. Uh, that's a great question. So the um, notice has two expenditure deadlines baked into it. Uh, I don't have them memorized, but I believe something like by September 30th, 2021, you have to have spent 20% of your funding uh, or you run the risk of us deciding we're going to take that money and reallocate it to another, um, another recipient. And then the second deadline, I believe, is March 31st, maybe 2022, where if you have not spent 80% of your expenditure money, we also reserve the right to sweep your money and give it to somebody else. So spending this money is really, really important. We know right now, like we're pushing expenditures. We want you to watch expenditures and we will, we will log um, your drawdowns as well. So if you tell us you spent 80%, but you've drawn five, you're gonna be, we're gonna watch that very carefully and you're gonna get a call from someone from HUD saying, uh, where's that? Where, where are these, these vouchers for your draws? Because that's really important and people really wanna know this all over the place. Um, but again, where if you can't spend your money quickly up front, we know you're still getting subrecipient agreements together, you're running NOFAs, you have CRF funding that you should be prioritizing, right? Like that all makes sense. But come, you know, middle of next year, if you haven't started showing some real progress for spending, that's something that's going to be a red flag for us. It just is. So we just want to put that out there that we know that things take time, but we also have like, well, the people who gave you the money, Congress in particular, they really want to see the money spent. Uh, we're already getting lots of questions about why isn't this halfway spent? <laughs> like, um, because it takes a while to get money, like, down all the way to providers. So we're going to try to give you guys some cover that way, but also just recognize that we will be looking at it. Uh, you don't have formal uh, thresholds other than those two in the notice, but we will likely be talking to you before then if we're not seeing expenditures. And you can see the same kind of thing that, that HUD is seeing on your dashboard. So we're showing you the, um, 
your authorized amount, how much you've drawn, and then what's your balance, right? In this case, they, they've um, drawn um, $509,000, so we're going to expect to see when this first report comes in an expenditure of at least $509,000. And then, and then we'll show it where um, where where it's actually uh, landed. Uh, we've got a question here about um, how do I know what level of access I need in Sage as the HMIS lead for my COC community in my in my community. So one more time, the HMIS lead does not need and should not have access to SAGE. The HMIS lead gets access to a portal that's individually built for them from the recipient. So when the recipient sends you the email asking you for the bundles, in that email, there is a link. You'll click on the link and it'll take you to a portal. The portal is just for that recipient and your HMIS. And it's going to show you exactly what you need to do. So you do not need to register. You have full access to everything you need to do. And it's sent to you via the link in the email. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, is there a specific naming convention you should use when you're creating projects for uh, the round or the first allocation versus the second allocation? No. Na uh, project naming? Yeah, HMIS project naming. We don't care for CD1 and CD2, but there are two things to bear in mind. Right? So for round one and round two, if you have a substantial amendment date, Prior to 9-1, that gives you an allowance to serve more than 12 months in rapid rehousing or emergency shelter or temporary emergency shelter. Uh, you can use naming convention or any other recording device, but I would recommend that you have some way of knowing what projects are associated or what pot of money is associated with that substantial amendment allowance, because that's really important for you uh, and we're, we've been talking about putting some sort of um, flag or date in stage so you have access to, like, you know if your CV1 it counts on HUD's records as prior to 9-1 uh, or your CV2. Uh, so that's one thing. The other thing is we find that naming it in HMIS and data is the worst. It is, like, so all over the place. It's, it's very painful. I work with the HICS a lot, the housing inventory count, and I am not able to map the housing inventory count data to our COC program data to our ESG data uh, very well at all because names are all over the place. My recommendation to get the bundles right for recipients, please talk to HMIS leads so that you know what the projects will be named so that the bundles reflect that. Because if you have this like weird thing of this, this bundle doesn't look right, but it turns out it's a naming convention, you're just going to lose a lot of time because names are all over the place. So CV1 and CV2, not so important. Naming for bundle purposes, yeah, that's really important. So please work together and use a name that everyone's going to understand so that we, we get the right projects in the right bundles. Um, let me just tell you that we went to great pains to um, give you the names of the recipients and the names of the projects that you've previously funded with ESG money. So if you're going to fund the same shelters, probably, right, because those are the shelters in your community, those names will already be in SAGE. We, um, we put them in there for you so you can, um, so you can actually pick on the names and um, there's a drop down that comes down. It's always hard to show this because I'm always in a um, project that doesn't let me do what I want to do when I want to do it. But the, um, when you go to add a new project, the subrecipients, there's a drop down list of all the subrecipients you have ever funded. And we 
pains to get that to be an actual name and not an acronym. There's also all the subrecipients if you have sub subs um, that were funded and then the project names, you've got to do that yourself. But at least you're going to get it to the right uh, recipient and subrecipient doing this. So hopefully it helps. But we really don't, we really, really, really want to stress that you do not use a contract number as your project name. ESG is notorious for doing that, and uh, HMIS leads are not going to know what to generate for you if you do this by contract number. You've got to put in a, a name that makes sense to them. You may put in anything you want in this optional tag um, field. We gave you a field for those of you that just have to put that contract number in somewhere. We gave you a field to be able to do that, um, but you just can't. Um, you just got to name something in a name that they're going to recognize. Thank you. On the add a um, HMIS contact page, I've got a question here on step two um, on the setting up comparable database system contacts. For a victim service provider, do we list the VSP agency itself? or the program contact that the VSP use. For example, they fund two domestic violence shelters, which uses a third party program to track their data. Do they record the third party contact or the contacts at the shelters themselves? So I'm gonna give you the, the, the legal answers to this question and then you can figure out what you wanna do from there. Every, um, victim service provider organization is expected to have their own um, comparable database. It's not a database that's shared statewide. Um, so in that case, you would put, if it's the YWCA, you'd fill in the YWCA and, and their, their information here. If that's not what's going on in your community, then you got to figure that out, and I don't think we can give you real support or direction for that. We are assuming that every victim service provider organization is its own contact for, um, for SAGE. So the one layer I may add to that is I think the question is probably getting at, well, who's going to, like, who, sh who should get the email to run the CSV? That's probably a question for the victim service provider to answer themselves, right? Like, who's actually going to run your CSV? Uh, it may not be the primary contact in the, via, in the victim service provider. It might be a staff member who's more or less acting as the HMIS lead or comparable database lead for that project. Right. That's, that's acceptable, but that's the question to be answering uh, that you should ask, I guess, before is who's running the data? Because if you send it to somebody who's not touching or not going to run the data, uh, the email is going to be pretty useless. So, so answer that question first. That should help you know who to set it up or send it to. Uh, we had a question that says, how do we name our bundles? So do you want to talk through that, Michelle? How bundles yeah, get their name? So you don't name your bundle, Sage is going to name your bundle for you. Um, Sage, Sage creates the bundles and Sage will name the bundles and <clears throat> the bundles are named um, based on the HMIS, the type of project it is, and we're showing um, what, uh, what quarter that, that's in. So this is a bundle for one roof to provide homeless prevention um, and they need to do one upload and there are six projects in it and so the bundle name is set by SAGE. You can't change it. The recipient can't change it. It's the way the data is going to get locked together. So you, you want to leave the bundle names alone. They do make some logical sense if you look at them. And if you use something logical to name your HMIS. Okay. Um, Alyssa, I'm sorry, you had a question that says, can you show an example with RRH? And I don't know the context in which you asked that question because I was scrolled up in the list. So if you want to add a little more clarity there, that would be helpful. 
um, in the meantime, William, this one's probably for you. What are the spending expectations for base 2019 and 2020 ESG spending with ESG CV expenses? So um, I guess I'm not exactly sure to how to answer that. We would just see your normal, your 15, or sorry, your 15, your 19 and your 20 ESG allocations. You're under normal rules. Uh, right now, we haven't added any special reporting, and we do not plan on adding any special reporting if you use some of those funds to prepare for, prevent, or respond to COVID. Uh, we're not going to do anything unique there, so you should have to be concerned about that. But for spending expectations, there's, there is no, like, 2080 piece like we do for the notice. There's just the normal requirements under, um, under the ESG rules which I don't, uh, I'm not the, the premier expert on that, but my understanding is there's no expectation other than spend 100% of your funds within a two-year two year ex uh, expenditure deadline. And, and you can also see your normal ESG expenditures or your draws, the draws you have made from the system here. Um, I know many um, ESG recipients have, have said to us in AAQ that they don't know whether their finance office has drawn the money. It's just that communication thing going on. You can see right here, this comes in about weekly from IDIS into SAGE. Okay. Um. So Alyssa added a little more clarity. Looking at workflow and examples with street outreach and was curious if the reporting was the same or looked the same in SAGE. We were awarded RRH and we don't have shelter outreach or anything else. It looks the same. That's the way to look at it. Sometimes we focus on our, on our kind of demos here on street outreach or emergency shelter. There are some nuances associated with them because you can put ESG CV money into an existing shelter. Uh, it creates some reporting issues with the starting date that you're going to use so that you don't over-report people who just never got our money, uh, right? So that's just, we tend to use those examples with rapid rehousing and homelessness prevention. You're going to set up a new project for your ESG CV funding. You can set up multiple projects if it's your desire locally, or you can set it all in one. Uh, and then at that point in SAGE, it all looks the same. Instead of selecting emergency shelter, though, you're going to select a bundle for rapid rehousing. So there's no, no real difference in how you set it up in SAGE. Thanks. Uh, we had someone ask to see an example of a project name in SAGE. I think that's the page you're on here, Michelle. So these are the actual project names that I pulled out of this um, project for demonstration purposes. This is what this is what the project was named somewhere between the CSV upload in Q4 and what the provider put in. So we literally we didn't name your projects, but for sub recipients. Um, we did all that work and we literally looked at question four in the CSV uploads compared to what the recipient um, had put in and tried to give you the best shot at a name uh, for the sub-recipient and sub-subs. And then the, the names, like, see there's two shelters at the Y here and they need to know then what the which shelter do you want where right and this y crosses this is a state um app the state caper report this 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 y crosses um jurisdictions so they they have one that's coming in in a um family violence program and then they have another one that's coming in just as a regular RRH that's not a, that's part of an interfaith hospitality network. So Christopher had a follow up there, which should correlate with the project name in HMIS. That was a statement. 
So yes, so that column there that says project name, uh, that's going to be what's included in that bundle email. That's what the HMIS lead is going to need to match up to their project coming out of the HMIS. Right, but so here, here's, here's the dirty little secret. Project naming is a mess in HMIS and at the ESG level. The project names in the HMIS oftentimes don't look any clearer than the project names that you were putting in if you put in a contract number on your screen. It's really, we're really going to, we've really come back and tried to say to the HMIS leads, could you name the project what the name of the project is and not some kind of formula in there. There's all these formula mixes that they put in to name the project. The project name is supposed to be the project name. Um, and it should match up with this. SAGE does nothing, nothing to read the names of the projects you put in and the projects that are in Q4. There is no way we could do that and make that work. So what's going to happen after this, after your first submission, is SAGE will show you the project ID that you pulled the first time to make sure that you're pulling the same thing the second time. It will, it will actually pull out and post the project ID for you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a question, when can we expect to receive the email with the portal link from SAGE? So again, remember the, the email will come once the recipient has uploaded all of the projects. Um, it sounds like this question is maybe coming from uh, an HMIS lead, and I would encourage you to reach out to the HMIS um, uh, sysadmin hub, and I can send the email for how you sign up in the um, sysadmin hub. But that's where all the information for HMIS sysadmins um, is going to be made available. Um, there was a, another question here, and I, I chuckled a little bit because I, Michelle, you and I talked about this question earlier today. Um, it's about the centralized rent administration programs and how to set those projects up in HMIS. Um, I don't know if we want to tackle that on our call here. Yeah, I didn't think so. So, Stacey, I did see your question. We do see your question in the AAQ. You will be getting an answer to that. Um, I didn't want you to think we were avoiding that. So, you will get an answer. Um, let's see here. Is, is, Meredith, was that, is that the person that put the AAQ in that's on uh -huh. here? Uh-huh. It would not hurt, Stacy, if you told us who funded those projects, how the projects got funded. One of the one of the uh, pieces that's missing in the in the um, information that HUD put out HUD put out a um, a project design. It's it's a really cool design on how to do this, but didn't put didn't correlate that at all to HMIS, and 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 we realized that this morning when we got the first questions on it. We will give you something with that. We just don't know what. But the big issue is who f who's funding the projects. Because the design works really, really, really well if all the money went to the same recipient and that recipient was the, what do they call them, the, what was the name of that, Meredith? Uh, Centralized Rent Administrator. Yeah. But that, but in real life right now, today, we know that's not what's happening. So you're going to have to still set it up somehow by projects, and we'll take a look at that. But we'd love to use um, your situation to try to help walk us through what are the options for this. Yep. Okay. Um, if our ESG recipient received their contracts from HUD in late September but won't have served any clients until October, Will the initial reporting period still have to be submitted, but with no client information? Yep, this gets back to if they've done that, then there must be a signed grant agreement. So there is some minimal level of reporting required. Uh, if, uh, as you say, we're just at the execution stage at, at the subrecipient level, then they'll essentially go in, they'll say, well, what's on, um, is it on the screen there? No, but they'll essentially it's say, coming. There we go. We'll get a chance to look at it. But it's very little. You'll essentially, in the financial section, you'll put all zeros. Yeah, so there you go. Do you have an executed grant agreement? Yes. And then have you made any expenditures? The answer to that will be no. And you're nearly done at this point, right? 
So you'll put zeros in on the expenditure form and you'll hit submit. And that's it. So you have very little you'll have to do. That means next round you'll have lots of fun stuff to report because you'll have lots of subs online. Okay, thank you. Um, I think that we might be caught up on questions here. But as soon as I say that, everyone will put them in. If I missed one, please um, resend it. But I think that we are caught up. I know there were some that, that seemed to be duplicates, so I skipped over them. But Yep, and we don't have to use the whole time. We just want to make sure on the recipient side, you're getting a chance to have a little more real-time access. Again, some things we're still sending you to the AAQ on, but we, uh, we want you to have access. So I see Patricia's questions, when will SAID webinars be available? Uh, they're typically available within three days after they're done, but sometimes they take a little longer. We'll publish this um, around that time frame and, and get it out to you. So we, again, I, we want to for this stuff. We're going to make sure you get your answers as quickly as possible. Uh, just recognize we're not going to do any webinars in October because you're going to be in the throes of it right now. Recipients should really be doing most of the work right now. All right, this is the time to figure out what a bundle is. This is the time to figure out what contact information you need, what projects to be included. Recipients should be full guns right now. And HMIS leads, you know how to, how to aggregate data or bundle your data in HMIS. It's just taking one project and another and all the ones in the bundle and then adding it together and submitting it as the CSV. So we will, this is why we are not doing many in October. A lot more of that will be done um, via AAQ. But, uh, if there is a need, we may end up scheduling one just in case. Uh, but that's that's kind of the the thought behind these office hours. I see a new question from Carla. If not all CV1 are executed, but some are, are we answering yes to the executed? So the execution is in relation to the recipient. Has the recipient signed a grant agreement with HUD? There's no way you should be signing a grant agreement with subrecipients. So. Uh, unless you have the grant, the executed agreement with HUD. So the answer will be yes, that you have a full agreement at that point, and we know some of your subs will be on and some won't, and, uh, and you should report on the ones that have served clients or incurred other costs. Thanks, William. I just wanted to add really quickly, too, I, I just checked the link. All of the materials from these trainings in the link I just posted in the chat all of the trainings thus far, excluding the one we're on right now, are all posted on that link. So you should be able to find um, all of the recordings, all the slides, chat, Q&A um, on that link. Just scroll to the bottom if, you, if you're not seeing it. Okay, I haven't seen any other questions come in. So we may be able to wrap up about five minutes early here. Anything else, Michelle or William, you want to say before we sign off? Thanks for all your hard work. We know this is not fun. Reporting is a pain, but we really, really appreciate your work, and we, we're available. We want to help you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks.